Thank you both, uh, David and Pavel, for the facts. Uh, we are now going to move into the art and skill of diplomacy, and it's my pleasure to invite Professor Shafiqul Islam, Director of the Water Diplomacy Initiative and Professor in Water Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, to talk about a negotiated approach to managing complex, we heard all about the complexities, water issues. Professor Islam. Good, good morning. I think I should come here probably. And thank you very much for inviting me. This is a wonderful uh, set of people, and I would make some preliminary observations, and I change my talk also. It was something that is on the screen will also change because whatever I heard for last uh, hour and few minutes. So it's raining outside, and as you can see, really, water is uh, everywhere. The difficulty water really, as David was suggesting, that this really is flowing. When it falls like this, we don't exactly know really where it came from. It probably, it, could, it came from perhaps from Brazil or from Colorado, but it's falling here. So whom does it belong? Is it a property or a right? When it falls here, it is really public property. But when it comes to your home, it becomes private, because you bought it. This continuous changing of really character of water really from public to private is ongoing. And that is really at the heart of the problem. When it's private is one thing, when it's public is different. And how do we deal with this? It's not easy. And that's what I'll try to really essentially conceptualize really what water needs to be understood, not for understanding only, but how do I also operationalize this so that I can do something about it? So if I listen to the first wonderful video put together, the key message that I got, how do I really put this into practice? We have done a lot of theory, and I come from two schools, really my original education was in engineering, now I also have an appointment at Fletcher. So I really try to dwell in both domain, but still I don't have the third domain, that is the political domain as the practice domain. I do some practice, but not much in politics. When we talk about what are diplomacy, is it really diplomacy that John Kerry does? Or is it the diplomacy that NGO does? Or is it somewhere in between? These are the type of questions I, I'll try to raise, and uh, please uh, forgive me, there is no solution that I would propose that can be done now. But I think there is a change in paradigm, as uh, Professor Kavat was telling, that we need to change the paradigm. The question then becomes, uh, what is that change entail? And how do we do this? At least do we have some clue that if I do something today, maybe 10 years from now I will give a different talk? We have been giving the same talk almost for 25, 30 years, at least in my lifetime. And if I take David and Professor Kavad, they probably have about 80, 90 years of joint experience. It's a huge amount of wisdom that they have collected over time. Now the question is basically, how do I take this wisdom? If I take this room, probably several hundred years of water wisdom is there. I really am not very much interested in the knowledge anymore. Because knowledge, I think we have enough to act. That act is not happening. So the question then becomes, really, how do I take that knowledge? and translate it to action that is measurable. And that's what some of the discussion would be, hopefully. So what I have taken the liberty, really, to look at the document that I was sent, there are three working groups. So I looked at three working groups, see really what they have been thinking about. So what are, working group one, so each group that I have taken, taken one premise and then one question. So conflicts over water resources are complex. We recognize this is a complex problem, and I will define really complex complexity a little bit differently than the English word means. 
then what they are trying to do really today over the next two days, what legal, institutional, and diplomatic methods are available for water conflict prevention and resolution. Then I go to what group two, non-collaboration is likely to result in a worse outcome for all parties. So that's an assertion we're making. And it's a right assertion. Then what they're trying to do, what are the linkages between diplomacy and system analysis? So that's a basically a very focused question. And then I go to the working group three. Change is a process of constant negotiation between the many stakeholders at different levels. A key point here is that many and different levels. Then they're saying that why is cooperation so difficult? Now if you try to link that to what working group two, the assertion there is we do need really to cooperate, otherwise our outcome will be worse. So we recognize this, but then we also find out, find out it's difficult. So what's going on then? I recognize the problem, and as a global community, this is basically representing 60 different countries, so our collective wisdom tells us we should cooperate. Then we raise the question also, it is very difficult. So what is going on? So what is going on, at least in my mind, and when I hear the first two talks, so David is telling that, look, these are three I problems. There is a problem of information, institutions, and infrastructure. These are mismatched, meaning that the information that I have for the hydrologic cycle at a basin scale may not fit the institution I'm trying to implement it with. That institution could be the country, could be a county, could be a city, there is a mismatch of scale of the natural process and the governance process that we have created. And then we create institutions. Those institutions try to match these disconnected scales. If we try to do this, to give you a very simple example, I work at Tufts, it's a university, and the library really goes between two different cities. So Medford and Somerville. Very small city, they have different traffic rules really. See, if I park on the Medford side, I may get a ticket really, I may not get it in the Somerville side. That's a very simple problem. But it just simply does not get resolved unless I know exactly where the heart of the problem is. So meaning that we have different jurisdictional entities that we have created that may not align with the water that we are trying to govern. And I'll show you some example really from the Jordan River why this could be seriously problematic really in terms of the implementation and action. So this is the diagram I like, really. So this is, I think many of you have probably seen this. This is the one that was given to really US general who was in charge of managing Afghanistan. It was published in New York Times about two years ago. So this is a morning, morning briefing. So general is sitting there, he wants to basically know what is going on. So this is what is going on, basically. These are the different links and nodes with all kinds of very complex diagram. And I can draw the similar diagram for the water problem that we talked about. The key question the general was asking that really, how do I increase popular support in Afghanistan? That is the question he asked, and he was given this diagram. It's thoroughly confusing, but when each of these nodes and the links were connected, we were exactly sure what we were doing. We knew exactly why particular coalition has to be built to do a particular action. But after a few years, we have built so many of those that now I'm thoroughly confused really what am I doing? Now, if you zoom in, really, to actual popular support, what they identified, you need only two things. You need to build trust among the Agban people and find out, really, what their cultural heritage is. If you do these two, everything else probably is not important. You're not going to change the terrain in Afghanistan. Some of these interventions does not even need military interventions. So what that tells you, really, this is a very complex diagram. This complex diagram is different than the way we understand complexity. Complexity from science really means that I do not understand cause and effect. This is very fundamental. In the, everything that I will say today really is that complexity means it's not complex just in the sense of being complex. It means that our fundamental scientific understanding of cause and effect relationship must be questioned. That is the change of paradigm that is needed. Classical Newtonian physics tells you I know cause and effect. If I do, then I have predictable outcomes. When I have predictable outcomes, decisions are very simple. Meaning that if I switch off a light, I know exactly it will go on or off. 
cause and effects are perfectly known. In that case, I can design systems, I can operate them, I can manage them, no problem. When the system becomes complex, it becomes a mess. In that mess, it is not clear exactly which links or which node to affect, and what will it do. That is what the problem is. The problem is that I simply do not have any clear interventions, where I can go and do this, and I know exactly this will happen. I may do certain things, it may create something else that I have no idea. As a result, really, management of water becomes very problematic. So in that sense, I make a difference between water and water as a resource. Water as a scientific object is something that science can do. I can understand really hydrogen and oxygen, their bonding. I can find out really when it will freeze, when it will become gas, no problem. That's a scientific object. I can tell you exactly how much water is there. That's an object. But when water becomes a resource, it's very problematic. Because then you have a coupling of all kinds of things, and we'll talk about this. So when water becomes a resource, who has more right? Is fish more important than the farmer? Is urban development more important than irrigation? These questions do not have scientific answers. This question must be negotiated by the people who are affected by this. That's a very fundamental change in thinking. So then I come to these three things, really. So I'm saying, so I'm trying to develop a framework that can be at the same time theoretical and can be operationalized. So if I start from values, interests, and tools, we have one way of thinking about this problem. Usually, if we think in, along this line, if I start from the values that I really want to sustain the planet for my grandchildren, that's a value. If I want to do this, then I can talk about my interest. Then I can talk about my tools. How should I do this? This is one way of thinking, thinking about this problem. On the other hand, I may also decide that, no, I know exactly what to do. I want to build a dam. I want to create hydropower. I start from the tools, because I want to help my people. I want to create enough wealth so that I, my GDP goes up. That's a very different way of thinking about this problem. So depending on really how you think about this problem, that dictates really what you will do. So what we argue really here that we have been thinking too much really from the tools to values than other way around. So unless I basically change that particular thinking, it's not going to work. And that can only happen really, I don't know really what the values of people in Zambia is. I can pretend to, I have to really involve them. I have to ask them really, what do you really want to do? Then I can do as a global community, look, these are the tools those are available for you to do it more effectively. What I argue that I think mostly what we have been doing so far is that we have been using our tools to do certain values that I have no idea really what values I'm trying to promote because those are not mine, those are somebody else's. So I take TVA, for example, from the US and go and implement it in India or in Bangladesh, thinking that we have done it in the US, why not do it there? Very logical and very sound argument, but the question is that they may not be interested. If they're not interested, if their interest is not served, then my tools are really not very useful. And that is exactly what is happening that we have been going through a continuous problem of really reinventing the wheel, doing something so effective, but simply does not work. So from that perspective, so we say that water is not a fixed resource. We've been thinking about the water is a scarce resource. Yes, water as a quantity has not changed in the time of dinosaur. Now seven billion of us here, yes, there are competing needs. That does not mean that water is a scarce resource. Water is a flexible resource, meaning that I can create those flexibility in multiple ways. There is enough water in the ocean, really. If I start desalination, basically I have no problem with water. Yeah, you, we talk about really what are the environmental consequence of that, that's a separate question. I have enough energy in the sun. I'm only capturing part of it. So there is enough energy. What are the consequences? Can we do it economically? Those are different questions. So the question is not really whether we have limited resource. Yes, we have limited freshwater resource. But that resource also can be used multiple ways. The water that I use today for taking a shower, tomorrow you can use it for growing tomatoes. It can become private, public in a very complicated way. So it's continuously recycling. So there are multiple ways we can create those 
flexibility. We can create flexibility through technological innovation, legal innovations, by control, by pricing. There are many, many ways to create flexibility. The question is that we have to create flexibility. If the pie is fixed, needs are many, there will be fight. That's human history. So that cannot be avoided. Our job is to create that flexibility. So that's our fundamental premise here. So I'll talk about four different things. To domains, systems, shares, and uncertainty. And see really whether we can reframe this problem. Whether we can change this paradigm that we have been thinking about for last 40, 50, maybe 100 years. So domain, we have three different domains, natural, societal, and political, and we go into those more system systematically. So these are the domains really we conceptually look. There are only, make it very simple, there are only two domains natural and societal. Those are the ones basically that the engineer or scientists are working on the natural domain. Societal domain, economics, policy, scientists, Fletcher, and other people are doing it. And we made them very simple. We said there are only three things in the natural domain, quantity, quality, and ecology. In the societal domain, I have governance, I have values, I have assets. These are very broad descriptions with only six variables, because we cannot even think in three dimensions, let alone six dimensions. So I'm not going to put many more here. You can create sub-variables. So governance, when I say governance, I'm talking about from Obama to really the mayor level. So it can be really at different levels. Depending on which level you use, you create subcategories of variables. Then what happens really, mostly it has been happening in those two domains. What we are arguing here is that no, this is happening in a politically real world. So it is continuously being spinned. Depending on that spinning, many of these variables may become totally unimportant. The question then becomes, which one is important, which one is not important, that depends on the context. Although water is a global good right now, but actually water politics is local. That local politics will be dictated by the political spin that goes on there. So a particular problem may be only relevant there for water quantity and economics, nothing else matters. So I really don't have to look at those. So then you have to think about this Afghanistan diagram. It's a mess, but in that mess, not all mass is equally important. If I am going to really guarantee water for the Hague, only quantity, then I have a different problem than if I'm trying to guarantee the quality of water. So I need to decide what the problem definition is. So that really depends on what domain I'm interested in. Then we go to simple system. Simple system is basically where cause-effect relationships are known. This is the one that we have learned really in school. That yeah, I want to basically make a very efficient flushing toilet. Very well done. Now it's basically you can use almost one third water that we used to use 20 years ago. Very predictable, very usable, engineer, done. Complicated, I really want to bring water to my home from a reservoir 40 miles away. It's a complicated problem. I need to go through a lot of pumps, pipes, turbines, and then on the 16th floor of my apartment, I open the faucet, I get water. It's a complicated problem, but we have done it. Complex problem is, is the Jordan River. Now, I have five different countries. Water is flowing. I've been using really for all kinds of things. And then Jordan River doesn't have water. Natural, societal, and political process all became entangled. This problem simply cannot be solved by the tools that I have developed for simple and complicated systems. This is where the problem is. We need to recognize that the problem of water in Jordan River is quite different than designing a flushing toilet or designing a water treatment plant. This because it couples with the natural, societal, and political problems. Then I talk about three different sheds. So watershed, so this is the watershed for Jordan River. It goes to five different countries. Watershed is what most of us are familiar with. Meaning that I know where the water falls and where it goes out. It's a physical boundary defined mostly by hydrologists, and well done. That has been the predominant thinking of water really as a quantity. Now, if you go to policy shed, five different countries are involved. So it's much bigger than the watershed. This is not matching. Not it's matching for the Jordan River. It doesn't match for the Ganges, because Ganges, there are Nepal, there are Bangladesh, there is India. Bangladesh is only interested whether they will get flood. The watershed is quite different than the policy shed. Then you have problem shed. We've done 1994 treaty in Jordan River, only between Israel and Jordan. Is very focused, done very well, but it really does not talk about other three countries. So how would it work? So if I want to really manage Jordan River, I cannot really just rely on the 
Israel and Jordan. But that's what they've done in 1994. It is much better than what Johnston was trying to do for 1948 to 1994. Nothing has been done. Why? Because at that time, Johnston was basically being very nice. He wanted to use water as a resource, but not as a political tool. So what we found out, after 50 years of negotiation, it did not work. Because political process was taken out, we thought we can keep this separate. In 1994, Israel and Jordan said, no, we'll do it ourselves. What did they do? They have created some interesting stuff. Lake Tiberias was there. Jordan needs water really in the summer. They said, OK, Israel, you basically keep 20 million cubic meters of water in your lake. Give it to me in the summer. In return, I'll give you 13 million cubic meters of water in the winter from my river. It is a trust building exercise. So I'm building trust by doing something that already existed before. So the question then becomes, how do I create this? How do I create an option that exists there but could be creative by creating those flexibility? Then, of course, there is uncertainty. And that is what is the heart of it. If everything was certain, really, there is no problem with management, really. Management, the heart of the problem is uncertainty. And that uncertainty I will categorize in three different groups. Information. Information means I really do not know what will happen next year. Even in Jordan River, I do not know what will happen. What is the amount of water that will come? So I need to have a way to scientifically create that. Is stationary dead? I do not know. But I do know variability will be there. I do know that there are all kinds of things happening that I have no idea what will happen next year or year from now. But is there a possibility to create that uncertainty in an effective way that creates flexibility in water? One example that could be used, for example, is that let's say that I have a 30-year of record. And I am two countries, Israel and Jordan. So I, this is what will happen. Every year, Jordan gets the average. Other country gets whatever is left. So that could be more or less depending on the variability. Year after that, it changes. Meaning that now Israel gets average, Jordan gets whatever is left. So as a result, I have created a mechanism. That mechanism is fair, because I have no idea what will happen next year or year after. We'll do it continuously. And if I need more water, if you have something in your reservoir is stored, you'll give it to me with the condition that next year I'll give it to you. This is exactly the way we used to behave when we were tribes and hunters. Not that we are cooperative, because we are cooperative by design. If you are my neighbor, and I went to and I hunted a deer, I cannot eat it, so I give it to you, because I did not have a refrigerator at that time. I cannot store it. So I have to give it to you, so next time when I do not have hunt, you will give it to me, because you have hunting. So that is the way they have created flexibility 100 years ago. And we could not do it here really now. Of course, then uncertainty of action. Just because I have information doesn't mean I act. We did not act really during the Sand Deal. Sand Deal basically created $60 billion loss for New York and New Jersey. We knew this, this type of hurricane can hit New York in even 10 years ago. We just did not act. So if I did not act, even based on the information, doesn't help. So that, that uncertainty of action really needs to be accounted for. Then, of course, uncertainty of perception. Perception meaning that is just because I have information doesn't mean that my perception will change. Perception is much more deeply rooted in the trust, and that trust needs to be built over time. And then, of course, I need to talk about these boundaries. Who created that boundary between Israel and Jordan when I talk about Israel-Jordan 1994 treaty? That boundary choice is extremely important for the definition of the problem. So why do we choose this particular boundary? Because I knew that five different countries will be very difficult to get hold. So let's do it only with two. So that's a boundary choice. By the time you have created that choice, you have already defined the problem. That problem simply cannot resolve the problem for the Jordan River. Then the question is, who, how do we choose this boundary? In this particular case, those two are the stakeholders. It ignores what is the relationship between Palestine and Israel or Palestine and Lebanon, or Lebanon and Israel. So these are neglected. We need to recognize this. This choice already has an implication, although it is engagement. Then accountability. What method do I use? What metric should I use? That is also not very clear. We use science, but science is not very objective anymore. Why? Because science with the water resource problem is very subjective. Depending on, for example, do I really use seasonal flow? Do I use annual flow? Do I use daily maximum? 
These are questions have no really clear answer. This needs to be discussed by the people who are affected by that. When I choose to use seasonal flow, it's a different question than I'm using five-day average flow. Although both are scientifically objective and defensible. So that means those accountability really must be rooted in the engagement that I have. This is why the stakeholder is important. Just because I bring in stakeholder doesn't mean it solves the problem. It simply doesn't. They need to know exactly what they are going up to and why. When that question is answered, then it is useful. So that essentially goes to this, how do I create flexibility? And by recognizing that this is no longer a system, this system is open. Water system is open, meaning that it is crossing multiple boundaries. So I cannot talk about system. System is very good when it is bounded. It is not bounded anymore. So it is continuously changing. And then it has uncertainty, variability, nonlinearity, feedback. These are all messy. To solve that problem, then I need participation. I need joint fact finding. I need to be adaptive. More importantly, I need non-zero-sum approaches. So non-zero-sum approach meaning that I need Lake Tiberias to store 20 million cubic meter of water. So that when I need it, I'll be giving it to them. By doing this, I'm also creating trust. So as a result, really, this is a self-sustaining system that will work very well. So just scientific information is not important enough. I need contextual understanding. If I put those two bubbles together, what I get a bigger bubble, that we're calling this extendable knowledge. And that same thing, basically, basically Ina Rostom told it very nicely. What she was telling is, is we need to have trust. And trust not only in between people and individual and institution, trust also in the way we create knowledge. Knowledge created after it is being done is not useful. I can use scientific knowledge to justify an arbitrary political decision. That is not very useful knowledge. And that has been done, really, very often. Yeah, I know what to do, and I'll tell you exactly what to do. That is the type of knowledge we have used to justify an arbitrary decision. This knowledge must be created before I make decisions. Meaning that there's 20 million cubic meters that Israel decided to store. It was done before the treaty was signed. So that means that is the knowledge base I need. Because it's a seasonal river. I need water. So what can you give it to me? So you give it to me before I even talk about really how much water I have. It's a mechanism. Whether it's 20 or 40, that depends really on the data. That is the way you start creating that knowledge which is trustworthy. So this is the framework that we have been trying to develop. So I'll not go into this. This is more that in the book that I wrote with Larry Susskind. It talks, talks to you about really three things. We have assumption on the left-hand side. Then we have what we are calling a theory. And then what is the practice that we can do. So in theory, essentially, you're basically going. So I'll, this is the last diagram that I show that. So either we have certainty or we have less certainty. That is one axis. Then I, if I have consensus, or I have no consensus. If you really think about this problem in that way, then simple, complicated, and complex problems become very useful to understand. Most of the time, we're in simple domain. That is the way we have been trained. So we try to solve all the problem with known cause and effect relationship. That is very, that's the green part of the diagram. In some cases, I have some certainty about the knowledge base, but not much consensus. Then I'm in a complicated domain. But most of the water problems that we are faced with right now is in the complex domain, meaning that I have not much scientific information, talk about climate change, talk about what is happening in Philippines or with Sandy. These are science itself is questionable. Then I don't have even consensus really how much money should the community invest. Society doesn't agree. So as a result, I'm in a domain really which is in the complex domain. Not much consensus, not much certainty, what should I do? So that's what we are. If there we are, then we need a different type of complex decision making. So we need a complex, complex decision making space where cause effect relationships are not known. So to do this really what I would argue that really, essentially we have created something really what we're calling Aquapedia. So this is a knowledge base we're trying to develop very similar to the idea that what our diplomacy consortium is trying to do. I hope this will go. I don't, I don't know whether I can get it to work. Let me see you there. It, it is going. So I'll stop you there because I think I'm almost out of time. I'll give you about two minutes. Hopefully this will work, but I don't think this is working well. Yeah. 
anyway, I think so. Let me give you just one thing here. How do I go to? How do I go to the next slide? Maybe we'll just put it here. So Aquapedia essentially is what we're trying to do really. We're saying that scientific knowledge and the contextual knowledge, these are different types of knowledge. This knowledge simply cannot be put together in journal papers. But this is what I started talking about, this idea of wisdom. So what we're trying to do really for each of the river basin, we had an example here for Jordan River. Apparently, I cannot get to the internet here. So in, in the Jordan River, now if you go back, you'll see really there are a few questions being asked. If allocation is the only problem, then what can I learn really from last 50 years of history from Jordan River? What, where else was it done? So if you go to like aquapedia.tops.edu, you'll see all this information there. So essentially then you can go to Indus. Indus also had the problem of allocation really between India and Pakistan. You go to the Ganges. So there are multiple cases share similar problems, not the same. The problem in Jordan River is quite different than in the Indus River. But what we are trying to do with Aquapedia is very similar to Wikipedia, is trying to put together a database of knowledge and wisdom. Meaning that what people have learned from Jordan River, that can be used in another river basin. So that way really you share this information across domains, scales, systems, and institutions, and learn few things. Those are not easily generalizable. As, as I call it, there is no Newton's law for water. So simply, I cannot take a particular law and apply it everywhere that it will apply. It will not. But some of the wisdom can be shared. And that is what basically Aquapedia will try to do. When we're trying to do this, maybe it is useful to think about these three sets of questions. So I leave those questions here. Well, it, is, it does not matter. These questions are so generic, really. You should be able to use it almost to any river basin that you want. Who has defined the problem? Who can convene the effort, and why did they do it? Who are the part participants and why they were involved in this? If those questions are asked at the beginning, then you know how to go to the next one. Then you decide, okay, what do I measure? Is it really seasonal flow? Is it daily flow? Is it annual flow? What metric should I use? Should I use John fact finding? These are the type of questions Then once I do, then I go really, is there a non-zero sum approach? And what is that approach for that particular basin? Are the decisions politically credible? What their mechanism to do, learn, and adapt? And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's now coffee time.